title of the message is Worship That Moves Heaven. Worship is an integral part of this church. Four years ago, God brought me back to the desert from Los Angeles to teach me what it is to be a worshiper. I was looking tonight, and God's just wrecking my heart as I see Zuri, my, my three-year-old, worshiping Jesus, right? I saw the other little three- and four-year-olds coming and bowing before Jesus, and God reminded me of how rough of a spot I was in spiritually. And, it, and I don't know if this is me or if it was him, but one of the things that we prayed when, when we found out we were pregnant with, with Zuri was that she would be a worshiper. And God reminded me of the rough spot that we are before we came here. And I don't know if I even if we even have Zuri, if God didn't bring us back to the desert and, and restore our marriage and fill me with his spirit. So excuse me. I've been weeping all all day. And uh, Pastor, I could have titled this, you know, last week you preached. Where are the weepers? I could have taught, I could have preached. Where where are the worshipers tonight? And, that, and that's kind of what I'm going to preach because worship isn't just singing. Y'all understand that? Worship is a life, and I'm going to bring the message from John four tonight. We're going to start reading in verse twenty one, very familiar text. I just seem to can't get away from John right now in my life, but. This is during the exchange that Jesus has with the woman at the well. And the topic of worship comes up. And in verse 21, Jesus is in the middle of talking to her. And he says to her, Jesus says to her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the, the main verse for our message tonight is here in verse 23. It says, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Dave Freeman co-authored the best-selling book, A Hundred Things to Do Before You Die. A Hundred Things to Do Before You Die. And sadly, his life was cut short. At the age of 47, he died. Having only completed half of the list that he himself compiled. He, he died tragically in a fall, and his, he hit his head in his home in, in Venice Beach, California. In the beginning of the book, he begins by explaining the, the truth that he says this, this life is a short journey. How can you make sure you will fit in the most fun and that you will visit the coolest places on earth before you pack those bags for the very last time? As I was thinking about Dave Freeman and many other people in the world who spend their life trying to fulfill uh, themselves through travel, through entertainment, through pleasure, through uh, obtaining position and prominence and wealth and all these other things that won't matter in eternity. And they fail to realize, like Dave did, that we were made to worship. The very reason that we were made was to worship God. And the truth of the matter is, we see it all the time. Everyone worships something. And I was thinking about this this few weeks, and I, I came to the question in my mind, in my heart, what kind of worship moves heaven? What type of worship reaches the heart of God? And as I mentioned many times from this pulpit, that our 
American church culture has cheapened what worship is. I've learned this. The devil doesn't care if we sing songs for a half hour and have an emotional experience, but then we walk out the doors and we serve the things of this world. We sacrifice not for God, but for the idols that we are trying to obtain. We feed our fleshly desires and the devil doesn't care if we have an, a, a worship experience for a few moments. If we get emotional for a few moments, what the devil, and let me tell you this, this is what, this is what the competition has always been about worship. The devil, he mimics God. And God, we're going to see in a moment, the Father, he, he's seeking worship. So is the enemy. And I've learned a long time ago that worship, the reason why there's so much intense controversy around worship and, and what it, how, to, how to define it and what it looks like and, and, and why is there so much contention? Many churches have split over this. And I mean, so, why is there so much contention around this subject? It's because it's powerful. Not just the singing, but the life behind the song. Some of us, we are asking God to rend the heavens when what we need to be asking for God to do is to rend our hearts, to make us once again worshipers. I was thinking about the definition of worship, to be in awe, to be in awe of Him. We've lost our awe, we've lost our wonder, we've lost... The, the sacred, holy respect and fear of God in our culture. And there goes what we are witnessing happen around us. We're seeing the deformation of human life. We're seeing human trafficking, those made in the image of God, uh, people, humans being sold. And we're, we're seeing it happen throughout our culture. And you know what the main thing is? It is because we have departed away from God and a fear of God and a worship of God. And so tonight I want to just take a few moments. I won't be long to, to unpack what Jesus said in verse 23 about worship. I believe this is the type of worship or that, that reaches heaven, that moves heaven. I want you to notice with me, first of all, tonight the Season for worship. The season for worship. Jesus says to this woman at the well, but the hour is coming and now is. The hour is coming and now is. And we talked about this many times as we've gone through the Gospel of John, how Jesus talked about divine timelines and how uh, there was a certain hour. And, and Jesus is talking in the same language to this woman at the well, and he's saying to her that the season for worship is now. Why? Because the bridegroom had come. The bridegroom had come. Emmanuel, God with us. This woman didn't yet realize who it was that was before her Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God that was before you, you would ask of me and I would give you the living water. It's, it was a special thing when Jesus came into the world. God became flesh. And I think we've gotten over the awe of that. We've gotten over the wonder of that. The omnipotent became human. The all-powerful took on flesh and he walked among us. And so I'm telling you, if not for any other reason tonight but that you may have, your, everything in your life may be falling apart, but let me remind you, if you're saved tonight, it's because Jesus came into the world for you. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came for me. And I, I don't know about you, but I know I'm a wretched sinner deserving of, uh, of being separated from God for all of eternity in a literal place called hell. I know what I deserve, and I'm thankful that he came. Just like that woman, she's in heaven right now. I bet you she's thankful that Jesus stopped by that well to tell her about the living water. Somebody say amen tonight. 
Oh, it's a season of worship for the church. Jesus said the hour has come and is now that the worshiper, that worship should take place. See, this woman was concerned about the logistics of her worship. She told Jesus in verse 21, or before in the verses preceding, that they worshiped in a certain mountain and, and, and that the Jews believed that you can only worship in Jerusalem at the temple there. Those Samaritan people had even erected their own temple uh, there on that mountain. And, and what Jesus was saying to this woman, he said, hey, you don't need to worry about where the hour is coming. We're neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Will you worship the Father? It's not about logistics. It's more important who you worship, the Lord. And I'm standing in front of you is what he would soon tell her. She did not realize who she was in the presence of. And folks, let me remind you, if you're saved, that God lives within you. So you can worship anywhere, anytime. You, you can go straight to the throne of grace. So oftentimes, the, the greatest, I have the greatest worship sessions, just me in the car by myself. And I, I'm a phenomenal singer when it's just me and myself. And <laughs> I got the soul of, uh, uh, I got it, it just comes out. <laughs> But it's a beautiful thing. And I'm not, it's not just a song. It's my life. And your life, is, it should be worship to him. This was a special time in history. Jesus had come into the world. And his soon death and resurrection would be the inaugural event of a new age. An age of true worship. You see, all before then, they had to bring in bullocks and lambs and doves and other types of sacrifice and to be sacrificed by the priest and and they could never go into the holy of holies there was a partition between a holy god uh, and, and unholy man and so this was different now he had come he where we could never go he he came to us and this is special i want you to get this he he came uh to to set off a new era an era i believe that is to be known as the era of worship he came to die a death so that we could be born again and and he was going to set apart a unique group of people a peculiar group of people who would be worshipers in the way that they lived in the way that they sacrifice in the way that they love. You see, Jesus was coming to set that example, but also to give new life. Oh, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation and old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this is what Jesus came into the world to do. And so now, my friends, is the season of worship. Why don't we worship him like we should? That from every nation, I was thinking, we sang it tonight, from every nation, tribe and tongue, from every ethnicity, from every socioeconomic class, from every corner of the globe, there would be a people that would worship him, that would bring honor to him through their lives. And this is the hour of worship, the season of worship, but I want you to see secondly tonight, worship that reaches heaven is authentic worship. Look at verse 23. He says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Let's unpack that. God is looking for authentic worship. He's looking for true worshipers. Now, it is impossible to worship God, and this is elementary, but it, I want us to just understand this tonight. It is impossible to worship a God who you do not know. He said to the woman at the well, you worship what you do not know. Jesus made the trek to that well, Jacob's well, because that woman didn't have a relationship with him. She had religion, but she didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. 
and true worship, authentic worship, it is done from a heart that has been redeemed, from a heart that has been re, re, uh, reborn. And I want you to remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3. He said, Have, you must be born again. And often I wonder this, is our problem with worship and, or the lack thereof is because there are many in our churches who have not been born again. Because the, the heart cry of those who have been redeemed is to worship Him, to worship at His feet. Look throughout Scripture and the heart of those who had received His grace, who had received His salvation, they wanted to be near Jesus. They wanted to be uh, close to Jesus. They desired to serve Jesus with their wealth. I remember one of the first sermons I preached was on Mary Magdalene, out of whom the Bible says went out eight devils. And when she got saved, the Bible says that she joined Jesus' entourage and she went and she ministered unto Jesus. You know what that means? She served Jesus. Jesus was hungry. She made him some food. Jesus needed water. Uh, she brought him water. She was there to serve him. Her heart was for him. She wanted to be in close proximity to him. I find it very telling when we don't have a desire to serve him. When we don't have a desire to Praise Him. We don't have the desire to sacrifice for Him. God is looking for true worshipers, those who have truly been saved and have the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus says. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. I want you to get that part. Only those who have trusted in Jesus Christ by faith and faith alone receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You can't worship God without the Holy Spirit. And you can't come to the Father except through Jesus. So it's a perfect, uh, it's a beautiful picture here. I want you to get this tonight. And this is why we always at this church try to emphasize first salvation and then being filled with the Spirit of God. The oil of gladness. I'm telling you, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you can't help but worship Him. You can't help but testify of Him. You can't help but witness for Him. You can't help but serve Him. And that's authentic worship in spirit. See, this woman, she talked to Jesus about the temple. But Jesus informed her about a new temple. That he would soon, when he said, I'll give you living water, we're going to see that in a moment, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. He was informing her of a new temple that she would soon become the temple of God as a believer on him. And this woman talked about worship and Jesus talked about salvation, the necessity of salvation in order to worship. He, he talks about the new birth. You must be born again. This woman talked about well from water from a well. And Jesus talked about the new water, the living water uh, that she could ask him for and he would give to her. And I want you to get this picture. You see, a person who is unregenerate, a person who isn't saved, has no uh, ability within them to worship God. And I would say this, Christians who aren't filled with the Spirit, they struggle with worshiping God. They struggle with surrendering to God their lives. They struggle with uh, being uh, humble before God. And we've seen it time and time again at this church, how pride-filled men, oftentimes I feel like they aren't saved, but pride-filled men ruin their families, ruin everything, and you'll never see them bend the knee and worship. And, and you see, always in the Bible, worship was viewed as a, a prostrate position before God. You, you're laid out before God. Here I am to worship God. Whatever your will is, God, that's what I want to do. You are my Lord and Savior. God, uh, whatever you say, that's what I want to do. That's authentic worship. But it's hard to find today true worshipers. True worshiper. As I mentioned before, every human is a worshiper in Romans 1. Verse 25, it talks about those who are not saved, those who reject God, who, who knew Him, 
for who he was, but did not worship him. And the Bible says, and they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. So when you hear someone say, well, I just, I just don't like to worship. I just don't really enjoy, you know, serving. I really don't like to do these things. They're lying. They're, they, they like, they enjoy worshiping someone else or something else. They enjoy spending their time, talent, and treasure on other things. They are worshiping something. But the question and the call that God is, is bringing out tonight is that he's looking for us to be true worshipers. To worship in spirit, but also in truth. God is looking for those who will obey Him. Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Now, I'm not telling you tonight that you have to be a theologian. Know every one of the commandments. There's, a, there's really hundreds in the Old Testament. I'm not telling you that you have to you know, like the Pharisees did, you have to tithe on, on the littlest things. I'm not telling you you have to, and no one can possibly follow God perfectly in the flesh, but what God is looking for is direction, not perfection. Do we serve Him? He is seeking for worshipers. I think about what Paul said in Romans 12. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable service. You see, the true test of our worship is our lives. Do we obey him? Jesus put it this way. If you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> We're struggling right now in the you know, the, the twos and threes with, with, with Zuri, she's in here right now. But um, the other day, she was giving mom a hard time in the, in the car, and she started, and mom started to play uh, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. <laughs> and she put it on repeat, pastor. And Zuri cried the whole way home because she didn't want to hear about obedience. And there's a lot of Christians like that. They don't want to hear anything about obedience. Don't tell me I can't do this. Don't tell me I can't watch this. I can't drink this. I can't do that. I'm a Christian. And, it, you know, it only matters that I prayed that prayer that one time. It only matters that, hey, I show up here once every three weeks, throw $5 in the plate. Hey, don't talk to me about living for God, a holy life, set apart life. You know what? That is an indication of a heart that is far from God or not regenerated. And I want to tell somebody tonight, may we, we pray for this. We pray that God will set our hearts on fire again. And that's when we'll see revival. Oh, I was thinking about this. Does my heart burn for him? I remember a time when my heart burned for him. When I would pay to go, if, someone, if there were five people there and they wanted me to come to San Diego, I'd put gas in the car. I'd take time off where I'd drive out there to preach to those five people and I'd preach my heart out. Get home and the gas light's on. I'm like, all right, God, I don't know how I'm going to get to work next week. I don't know how. He always would show up. I remember a time when I, I, he'd wake me up at night. I remember one time I was sleeping in my bed and there were some people making some hoopla outside my window and my flesh wanted to get mad and say, hey, knock it off. But you know what God told me to do? Get up, go out, share the good news with them. And I remember, it's like when I walked out, they all just sat down and, and were silent. And I just preached to them. And listen to me, I'll never forget it. I said, hey, do any of you want to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior? They all rose their hands. We prayed right there. I said, now I'm going back to bed. Can you keep it down now? And they didn't make a peep. I'm telling you, there was a time when my heart was on fire. And like God convicted me about that this week. Like, hey, you're growing cold. Hey, 
uh, you, know, you know, I remember when you would preach to, you'd preach harder to some empty chairs than what you've been doing sometimes lately. You've been kind of lacking in the prayer closet. You've not been pursuing me. Your heart isn't on fire. I'm telling you what, he, what he's done. What, you, what you're seeing right now is he's convicted me. You see, these messages, they only preach like this when it, God works in our hearts first. And I'm going to tell somebody, Ask God to light you on fire once again. Where are the Christians whose life song is to worship you, I live? I was listening to that on repeat today. The reason why I'm here, I can't help but cry out and serve Jesus. He's been so good to me. You see, when I was lost, he found me. When I felt hopeless, He was the way maker in my life. When I didn't know what to do, he's been the wonderful counselor. When I was discouraged, when I'm discouraged, he's the lifter of my head. When I feel alone, Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. When I'm weary, Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. I could keep going. He's been everything to me. God has been my father, my savior, my friend. He's been everything to me. How can I help but cry out and worship him? How can my life be lived for anyone else but for him? Oh, you see, the demons get it better than sometimes we do. Anytime in the Bible that they came into the presence of Jesus, they cried out. Oh, you remember that demoniac from the Gadarenes? When Jesus came on the shore, he ran up to him naked and and bloody and all that, all of his, uh, his openness. And he says, Jesus, what have I to do with you? Thou son of the living God, what you doing here? Are you going to torment me? He had to worship. He bowed down before him. Oh, I was reading about it this week week in Acts chapter 16, a little demon-possessed girl in Philippi. Oh, she was used by her masters to, to, to give fortunes and other things. She brought them great, great wealth, and, but she followed around Paul and, and Barnabas, and she said, this, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they share the way of salvation. After a few days of this, Paul got irritated. Because the Bible talks about she croaked it out. She, was, she, she, she sounded like a crow as she was saying it. And he turned around and he, he rebuked the demon within her and the demon came out of her and she went back to her masters and she could no longer see the fortunes or the future. Paul and Silas were thrown in prison. They were beaten. And prison isn't what we have in America where you get three square meals and a clean cot to sleep on. Prison, most prisoners die from the disease and the sickness and they had open wounds. But the Bible says that at midnight they worship God. Why? Because he was worthy of stripes. He was worthy of any sacrifice. He was worthy. Is he worthy tonight? And you know what's going to shake America? When true worshipers begin to worship him in spirit and in truth. Right now, even though it looks like all hell is breaking loose in this country, if we got back to worshiping, if we stopped looking at the world and start looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, hey, his world was messed up. Hey, he was under a Roman empire. Hey, he dealt with things, but he kept his eye on the race and he finished his course and he set the captives free. I'm telling you, that's what we have to do is worship. That's the type of life God will bless, will will use, will will, will do miracles through true worshipers. This is what God is looking for. The Bible says in verse 23 that the Father is seeking for such. God isn't looking for theologians. God isn't looking for the most talented, most beautiful, most influential. God is looking for worshipers. Those who love Him. Who will serve Him. Who will do it with joy. I've learned this. When you seek Him, you'll find Him. And it's like, a treasure of your life. When I seek Him, I find Him. I find Him to be more than I ever could comprehend. I find His presence in my life to be sweet. 
I find him to change my temperament. You've been, you've been losing your cool lately? In this heat? You've been, you've been on edge? Oh, I'm telling you. You better get back to worship then. And God will change your heart. He'll change your marriage. He'll, I'm telling you, this is all connected. Who you worship. where you're, See, some of you, you worship your spouse. And so when they, when they mess up, it rocks your entire world. Worship him. Oh, he's worthy. Now is the time of worship, church. We're going to see God in the heavens. We've got to become true worshipers. We've got to let our lives be aligned with what we see in Scripture. May God set our hearts on fire once again for him. May we fall in love anew and afresh with Jesus. So tonight, I want to ask you the tough question. I had to ask myself a lot of tough questions. You see, our kids see who we worship. <laughs> our kids are watching. They know if we worship, we sit at the altar of Netflix. They know, if, you know, our iPhones, you glue to that, heads bowed, eyes <laughs> on it. They know what we worship, and, and God just hit me with that this week. I want my kids to see me living it out, worshiping God. I want God to, to be pleased with my worship. He's seeking for such to worship Him. Verse 24, he says, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. It is an imperative. It's not optional. If, you, if we're not worshiping Him in spirit and truth, if we're not walking in the spirit, if we're not living in a life of submission and obedience, you, we're not worshiping God. We are worshiping a God that we are fashioning in our own mind. And this is not pleasing to God. And you're not fooled. You might fool me. You might fool your spouse. You might fool your mama and your daddy. But I'm telling you, you aren't fooling God. He knows tonight who has, whose heart he has tonight. And I want to encourage us. Maybe you've grown cold in your worship. Maybe your life is not defined by your relationship with God, your obedience to his word, your seeking his face. Well, tonight the altar is open. And you can repent of your coldness, your callousness, your indifference, your apathy. You can ask God to fill you. I'll never, I'll be forever grateful for this place. I just want to remind those who serve here, our pastor included, it's not in vain. I'll end with this illustration. There's a lady who reached out to the office last week and she requested a phone call and we get a lot of those requests we try to get to them all but sometimes some slip through the cracks but I just really felt the need to, to give this lady a call and she began to tell me her story about how they've served in ministry for 28 years her and her husband and there was a falling out at their previous church and they were hurt deeply and uh, they had to end up leaving they were asked to leave and uh, did you imagine 28 years you love those people, and it's just tough. And I think she had heard in one of the messages, me sharing, you know, just how ministry sometimes you get hurt. And it's not for the faint. It's not a week that doesn't go by where we're not hurt. And um, but she, she called for some counsel, and I shared with her my testimony and how God brought me to Westside to restore me. I shared with her how my heart had gotten cold, you know, after I was hurt and how I changed my phone number, how I blocked people on social media, how I didn't talk to anybody. I, and I, she was like, man, that's all the things that I wanted to do. <laughs> she said a few months ago, about four months ago, she had a dream that her and her family were coming down a valley, a green valley, and, that, and God spoke to her in that dream that he was going to water them in this valley, that he was going to restore them in this valley. And someone invited her, one of her, his co-workers, the husband, uh, invited them to church here. And as they were coming, her, her husband, her daughter, as they were coming off of Goaty Hill, 
she saw the valley there. And you know how much rain we had this spring? And it was green at the time. Not green. Is it green? I haven't paid attention. It's probably not green anymore. <laughs> and it was this green valley, exactly what she saw in her dream. And she, she began to cry. She said, oh, honey, this is what I saw in my dream. And she said, they, they've come and they've been watered here. You know what the first thing she said to us? You guys, I didn't realize that where we were, how, how worship had fallen to the wayside. And I love about the west side is the worship is, it's, it's about Jesus. And it's, you guys, there's no pretense about it. It's just about Jesus. And we've been watered here. We've been blessed by the worship, by the messages, by the fellowship. And um, I shared that with Pastor yesterday and just was reminded of what our God, what our God, He loves each and every one of you tonight. I want you to know that. And He sees where you are. And He wants to do a new work in your heart tonight, I believe. He wants to set you on fire. He wants to water you. He wants to give you a fresh outpouring, anointing. He wants to do something incredible. But I'm telling you, it doesn't happen if we just are half-hearted about our worship, if we're just going through the motions, if we're just, oh, I'm glad that's over. And so I want to encourage us tonight. The altar will be open. We're going to worship. I think we have more songs tonight. Looking forward to it. And then I, I want to just encourage us to do business with God.